Good morning, and greetings from New York. I'm very sorry not to be able to be there in person, but very pleased to be joining you today by video. I'd like to make just four main points on our topic of, of women's representation in global economic governance. First, as I'm sure speakers will also emphasize, women's representation in global economic governance, and indeed in economic, in economic decision making more broadly, remains woefully inadequate. Within the G20, we see just four heads of state, no finance ministers, and three central bank governors who are women. What's more, as research has shown, women represent less than 20% of public sector leadership across the whole G20. Only four countries in the G20 have a third or more women in leadership roles in the public sector. Canada, Australia, the UK, and South Africa. And this echoes the situation in economic decision making in the private sector. Across the e EU, for example, women make up only 15% of board members. Yet, we know that more diversity leads to better decision making. In parliaments, we've seen that a critical mass of at least a third of women makes a real difference. More inclusive decisions are made and more progressive legislation and policies are introduced. Having, ha having more women on boards also improves the bottom line. Fortune 500 companies with, with more women directors, on average, outperform those with fewer women board members on a variety of financial indicators. So we need to see much greater diversity in economic governance. Not only is it critical to ensure more rep representative leadership, it's also critical for accountability. Second, and just as important, is the attention to gender equality issues within economic governance which once again is woefully inadequate. Within the G20, discussion of gender, gender dimensions remains far too limited. Yet, the very goals the G20 sets out to address cannot be achieved without greater attention to gender equality. Raising growth and productivity requires a full, partic full participation of women in economies and societies. As we know, there's a clear correlation between women and girls' participation in education and women's participation in the workforce and economic growth. Full gender parity and labor force participation would boost the average GDP by 12% by 2030 among OECD countries. Yet, as a background study for the G20 labor and employment ministerial meeting shows, while women's educational attainment across the G20 has advanced to such a degree that gender gaps in, in education are often reversed, gender employment gaps of more than 10% remain in 15 of the G20 countries. Unequal legal tra treatment of men and women persists in some G20 countries. Only Canada, Mexico, and South Africa have no legal differences between women and men that, that restrict women's employment and entrepreneurship. And there's a persistent pay gap as well in all G20 countries. What's more, gender inequality imposes very significant costs to societies and economies. New research released just last week estimates that globally, violence against women, including intimate partner violence and the sexual violence, costs the world economy an estimated $4.5 trillion. That's $4.5 trillion a year, around 5% of the world's GDP. That's why it's so important that governments and economic decision makers prioritize and invest, not only invest in not only in increasing women's workforce participation, but also in addressing the underlying gender inequalities more broadly. Third, we really need to change the rules of the game. It's not enough to focus on, on whether women's participation is good for economies. We also have to ask whether economies work for women, and all too often, they do not. While gender, while gender equality is correlated with, with increased economic growth, the reverse is not always true. Despite strong economic performance, six G20 countries are in the bottom third of countries in the 2013 World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Index, which measures, as you know, performance in health, education, and political and economic empowerment. And four countries in the G20 are in the bottom half of countries on the UNDP Gender Inequality Index, which includes measures of reproductive health, educational attainment, and political and labor force participation. Clearly, in these countries, economic growth is not automatically translating into better outcomes for women. That's why it's so unfortunate that macroeconomic policymaking remains largely blind to gender issues, whether it's the unpaid care work 
predominantly uh, performed by women and girls, without which households and economies would not properly function, or the depressive effect of unequal participation in the labor market on GDP, or the extremely high cost to societies and economies of violence against women. What's more, all too often macroeconomic choices actually exacerbate existing inequalities, including gender inequality. As Oxfam has pointed out, the G20 includes some of the most unequal countries in the world. And most G20 countries continue to see rapidly rising rates of economic inequality. And at the same time, the economic crisis and the austerity measures that have been adopted in so many countries as a result have only deepened existing gender inequalities. Cuts to pensions, public services, and social protection have only increased women's concentration in informal employment and deepen their unpaid care work burden. Cuts, cuts to women's services in a number of countries have also severely exacerbated their vulnerability to violence. Yet gender sensitive policy measures can have a very positive impact. Inclusive economic growth that supports women's access to decent work and social protection, equal pay for work of equal value, paid, paid parental leave and quality affordable childcare services, progressive tax systems, and non-discriminatory non legislation that enables women's participation, all of these can go a long way to increase women's participation and reduce gender inequality. It's precisely such measures that should be discussed by the G20 if, if they are serious about boosting growth and productivity. Dedicated investment in measures that specifically address gender inequality and violence against women is also key. And fourth and finally, as we look forward to the post-2015 development agenda, it's absolutely critical that we focus not only on environmental sustainability, but also on financial sustainability. This requires good stewardship of our economies that is both representative and accountable. Women's participation and attention to gender inequality in macroeconomic policy is vital and makes a real difference to broader social and economic outcomes. We need to see much greater representation of women in all levels of economic, economic decision making, as well as dedicated attention to gender equality issues in all aspects of macroeconomic policy. And we need to continue to interrogate economic decision making at all levels, to ask not whether women are working better for our economies, but instead whether our economies are working better for women. Thank you very much, and I wish you a very successful meeting. And again, I'm sorry not to be there in person.